Hey everyone, it's Shaylin. I'm here today with another video. So today we're doing another line editing video. Another one was so requested, so much more than I even anticipated. Like everyone in the comments on that video said they wanted more line editing videos. A couple months ago, I asked you guys to send me in your work so I could edit it in a video. It was so kind of you. So many of you guys sent in work. I have 34 pages of work almost 10,000 words worth of stuff to edit. So yeah, the purpose of this, these videos, is not to tear apart the work that was sent in. Actually, it's to appreciate it. Um, the purpose of line editing is not to tell someone they don't know how to write. It's to fine tune language, and the reason I wanted to work with your guys' writing rather than my own is because I've done line editing videos on this channel with my own work and everyone has their own unique writer quirks. There's gonna be different things that we can learn from everyone's writing. And so that's why it's worth, I think, getting a range of different people's work. Please be respectful of the work submitted in the comments. Please refrain from editing it yourself because people didn't consent to that. Well, if there are any comments that are rude about the work, then I will have to delete them. The way that I'm editing here obviously is I'm just doing one pass. Normally when I'd line edit, I'd do two passes. Also, I do want to say that this is not exactly how I would edit or recommend editing if you're editing for another person, which obviously I am editing for other people here. But if I was editing for my workshop, I wouldn't be this drastic. Not because I withhold edits. You'll notice in these videos that I'll do things like add in whole details. I would never do that if I was editing someone's work and I don't recommend you do either. If I had a question where I felt like a detail would be necessary, I would leave a note that said maybe you could add a detail here. I would make more notes for people rather than making the edit myself. But because I want to show you guys what the thought process is when you think about choosing details and details that are worth adding, that's why I'm just making them up and adding them here. But obviously I wouldn't recommend doing that except in your own work. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm editing for someone else how I would edit my own writing in that I'm being a little more aggressive with it for the sake of education, okay? This first piece here is called Treehouse Girls. The trouble began when she fell from the tree. I just skimmed this and what you have here is a first line that actually chronologically hasn't happened yet. So the trouble began when she fell from the tree and then the next sentence is she was sick so I hoisted her up to the top myself. She falls from the tree afterwards, right? But naturally when we read we're gonna think things are happening in chronological order unless told. So I think you just want to begin a new paragraph there. Actually maybe it even was a new paragraph beforehand and I just missed that when I was formatting it because again I asked people to send these over like Twitter DMs so the formatting was pretty messed up. I had a first paragraph like this in a story once where it, I literally had the exact same thing. The first line was chronologically about five minutes after. It was also someone falling. It was, I will never tell you this. And then we went back a little and went worked up to how she ended up falling. And it was all in the same paragraph. And my professor was really roasted me. He was like, this was so confusing that if I read it in a magazine, I would have stopped reading it, which is unfortunate because the rest of the story is pretty good. She was sick, so I hoisted her to the top. I'm gonna up to the top myself. Here, I'm gonna delete up because it's just implied. She was sick, so I hoisted her to the top myself. Her stomach feeling far too empty bent over my arm. I do have a bit of a question about the logistics of that. Like if you're hoisting someone up into a tree or a tree house, I would assume that you're like pulling them up. So I don't know how their arm would be bent, how their her stomach would be bent over your arm. I do like that the detail that her stomach feels far too empty. I'm just gonna leave a note that says, hard to picture. Once inside, she lay on my lap as lightly as an orchid. She lay on my lap, I'm just gonna specify this, she lay her head in my lap. Um, just to specify like the physicality. What did you catch, I asked, and all she said was, hush, I'm sick. I tried not to roll my eyes as I shifted some pale hair from her forehead, so a vague word. So let's just specify that, a lock of pale hair from her forehead. You're still pretty though. She laughed. Well, I'm always pretty. It's my constant state of being. Queen. So here the punctuation is a little incorrect. So it's my constant state of being. You have um is actually get rid of the comma. You don't need a comma and an M dash. It's pretty rare. You won't see it too often, but if you do have M dashes interrupting dialogue, they, they do go outside, I believe. Do they go outside or does one go inside? I think they go outside. I'm pretty sure the rule with M dashes is that M dashes go outside quotations. Commas always go inside, so a cough. And then I don't think that the can't help it needs to be, should be capitalized because maybe I'm wrong on this, guys. I'm not a copy editor. I want to be clear. These videos are not meant to be an exercise in grammar. Copy editing is very hard. I took one copy editing class, but 
it's not my expertise. The point of this is more to look at like compressing the line, looking at details, showing versus telling, that kind of stuff, not grammar. Don't trust me when it comes to grammar. Don't trust anything I tell you, okay? But I think because you've interrupted it, it's not actually a new sentence, so they can't help that I don't think should be capitalized. Don't want you to, I said, looking up the wide wooden entrance to our hideout. I would love a bit more of description, just in general. I feel like maybe it came beforehand. I would love, I'm gonna leave a note. Maybe we could get a bit more description, such as what the tree looks like, what type of tree, the weather, etc. Don't you want to, I said, looking up the wide wooden entrance to our hideout? We lay in silence and I made sure to keep my breathing soft enough to hear hers. I'm gonna condense this a little. I made sure to keep, I'm just gonna condense to I kept. I was just line editing one of my own stories actually, and so much of line editing is is that is just what I just did. It's finding longer constructions and just smushing them into one word. I kept my breathing. Should it be I kept my breathing or I kept my breath? No, we'll leave it as that. Still, it was masked with the wind. My eyes had fluttered closed and I was falling asleep or maybe just drifting on the edge of it. I think that this is a bit of a familiar phrase, drifting on the edge of sleep. So I'm gonna leave a note that says familiar. My eyes had fluttered closed. So here we have a tense shift because we've shifted from the past to the past perfect because we have the had. I don't know, do we want that? My eyes fluttered closed. I'm gonna make this more immediate. You know, the immediacy is a little muddled here with this weird, this tense shift. So my eyes fluttered closed. I was falling asleep. I am gonna delete the just though because it's a bit of an unnecessary, it's a bit of a weasel word. So then again, and I'm just gonna make this more immediate. When they opened, at the opening of the treehouse. I would like to make this a stronger verb. So she was is, was is usually the weakest verb that anything can be. To just be is kind of the most basic thing that anything could ever be. So if you see the verb was, if you can just cut it from the sentence, that's cool. Or if you can replace it with a stronger verb, that's great. Sometimes obviously things just are, but in general, it's probably the number one weakest verb. So rather than her being at the edge, what could she be doing at the edge? She stood at the opening to the treehouse. Would that just be the door? I don't know what the what those things are called. So we'll leave it as opening because maybe that's like official treehouse terminology. Wavering on her thin legs, them bent like broken sticks at the knees. So is she like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be seeing. She looked at me then back out. Daybreak, almost as pretty as me. So it was night beforehand. I never got the sense of that until now. I think that this excerpt could definitely be fleshed out with a bit more description, just because Treehouse is an interesting place so we could get more about what it looks like. See, I didn't even know what time of day it was. Daybreak, almost as pretty as me. Ugh, queen, this character's dialogue is very iconic. I stood up at the back wall. I'm gonna delete stood. I stood at the back wall and got a good look at the horizon. Laying prone over the trees. I don't think you need the word there. The skyline wasn't half as pretty as her. Then she slipped. It almost looked like it wasn't happening since it happened all at once. Her hands, we've kind of had on the frame of the entrance, on the frame of the entrance, came off the wood. Maybe that could be a stronger verb, slipped off the wood and her hair blew in the wind. One hand strolling, falling across my face. Are they that close together? Maybe it should just be her face. I'm a little confused by how it could be falling across the narrator's face. And her hair, again, maybe blue could be a stronger word because she's falling. So her hair would go up, right? Let's get out our thesaurus. Rushed, let's try rushed. Her hair rushed in the wind. Mm, maybe that doesn't make sense. Fan. I feel like it needs to be something a little, ooh, maybe like something like whipped. This is an example, I talked about this in the first one, of, pre of a more familiar verb. Typically, what do things do in the wind? They blow, like leaves blow in the wind. One hand falling across her face like half of an X. Here's the thing, I love similes. I'm not here to tell you not to use similes. They're a beautiful thing. I think that this is a bit of a weak simile. Like half of an X is just a line, <laughs> like it's just a slash. And so it doesn't really add much other than the fact that it's a simile. So what I'm gonna do, when I think of half of an X, I think of a slash. So I'm gonna replace falling with slashing, one strand slashing across her face. We're gonna delete the word then. You, oh, you've also got it here. 
I understand why you have it because you're referring something that was hinted at beforehand but then is also kind of a weak word that typically we don't really want to see in our writing. It's kind of like started to or suddenly. Anything that signals this is going to start now is a bit redundant because we see it happen. So I change that to just she slipped, right? She slipped. The then is basically implied, right? Like then I started running or I started running. Well, it happened at that moment. So it was then. I added in the verb slipped when you already had it. I wonder if this could just be fell. She fell. She wavered to her left as if she was about to dance and tipped right over the edge. She screamed like a crushed fairy and I screamed too and I screamed. I don't know if you need the two set in and I screamed and I screamed too and ran for her. Maybe we could do like dove for her, you know, something a little more visceral like your friend just fell, you like dive after them. But of course, I think I'm gonna cut the but of course. I couldn't get to her before the sound of a dropped luggage bag silenced everything. Grasping onto the same place she she had moments earlier, I looked for her but only found a mass of pale hair scattered over something inhuman. My mouth opened wide enough for the skin on my cheeks to stretch. She was bent and broken at every angle. She looked like a broken dish. She looked like she had never lived at all, her jeans and t-shirt really thrown over her to cover the mess. I'm not sure what the luggage bag, I'm gonna leave just a note here meant to mean the sound of her landing sounds like a dropped luggage bag or is there actually a dropped luggage bag? If the former, I think it's a bit confusing, not the strongest simile since it is something a bit mild compared to a girl falling. So it kind of minimizes what's happening. I'm gonna say the same beam. So that instead of she's just holding a place, she's holding a beam. I think that's just a bit more tactile. I looked for her but only found a mass of pale hair scattered over something inhuman. You could definitely, if you wanted to, take issue with screamed like a crushed fairy because what does a crushed fairy sound like? However, I think that it seems to fit in the narrator's tone and the way that she perceives her friend. Friend is a little fairy tale like. The main character has a bit of a romanticized view of her. Clearly there is some kind of romantic tension, I think, between them, or at least from the main character to the friend. And so I think it works. I, I'm gonna defend that one. So a lot of the time with a sentence, you wanna end on the most impactful point of the sentence. The clause that is like the most like, uh, like gut punching is she looked like she had never lived at all. Her jeans and t-shirt merely thrown over her to cover the mess is less impactful. So I would either cut that, I'm just gonna leave a note because I think this is up to the author, or move earlier in the sentence so we can end on. The last sentence I think in general is a really effective finality for this paragraph. Oh, gut punching. Um, I have no room to judge because I've written many stories where children die, but yeah, overall, this is a strong excerpt. The author has a consistent writing style. It's not overwrought. There's a clear sense of the character relationship, and I can definitely see really clearly how it fits into the wider scope of an entire short story. This feels like a short story scene, not a novel scene. So if this is part of a short story, you're doing something right. It has the brevity of motion, the precision of writing that you would want in a short story. All right, so the next one is also from a short story. So this is called Hiking in Transylvania. Amber pulled a can opener out of her pack. Their rations looked small. Three bags of beef jerky and a couple warm cans, tuna fish and beans. I'm gonna change the punctuation. So their rations looked small, three bags of beef. I'm gonna make this like a list. Three bags of beef jerky, four tins of tuna, two cans of beans. The way before, again, this is not wrong. It's perfectly fine. That's just the way that I find rhythmically I like. A stack of hundreds peeked out behind the food. What's the tea with that? That's a great attention grabber. You know, if this is the opener of a short story, your first two sentences are kind of mundane. Your third sentence hints that there's something going on and that's great. You have intrigue in the first paragraph and it also comes as like a bit of a whiplash after we're just talking about beef jerky. Do you wanna hear a scary story? 
I would say not clear who's speaking. I would suggest to add a dialogue tag there. No. <laughs> I love the bluntness of that accent. I lolled. I'll, I'll say I lolled. It's just, it's so blunt. Like the journey had been quick, a night and a day. Um, that should be an M dash on hyphen. They'd reached the summit tomorrow at dusk. Details were scant. Neither knew how long they'd be staying. Valley's off, a wolf started shrieking. I think that this could be a bit more visceral of an image, so let's punch it up a bit. So a wolf started shrieking, started, calling you out on the started. So I'm gonna say a wolf's shriek pierced through the valleys. I think that that's clear that it's far off because it's several valleys off. It's pretty here, very. I'm not clear on who's speaking, especially because I don't know. At this point, I don't, I have no idea who the other character is. And I also don't know if Amber is the one saying, do you want to hear a scary story or no, or it's pretty here or very. We don't really know anything about the other character. Oh wait, is this in first person? What? Okay. Amber watched the light of the fire play off the purples, the mountain's purple rock. That sounds like it's in her point of view. It glowed and rippled. I don't think that we need that instead and instead of watch instead of play i'm going to say amber watch the light of the fire ripple off the mountain's purple rock she stared back at the flame into the flames i'm going to keep your verb i'm going to keep glowed for you okay i'm working it in so you can have both glowed orange soon it will be morning and i wait it's in first person what is happening um soon it will be first person and i will be trudging up that hill in the heat and this fire will be gone. But before that, I will be in my tent and the embers will be outside beating and breathing until they give out in the middle of the night with no warning, until they pucker, burn, roll over and... Okay, you've got no punctuation here, but that seems extremely intentional. I'm just gonna fix your hyphen. Um, I'm gonna read that one more time, but to be honest, I don't wanna mess with it. You seem to know what you're doing with this paragraph. I don't know who the I is and if the I is in the scene or if the I is like someone who's outside the scene. I'm just gonna leave a note, clarity on who is the I. Soon it will be morning and I will be- is it morning? Because it looks like it's- I will be charged up a hill in the heat and this fire will be gone. Okay, I'm gonna leave that. There's a lot of tension here. This feels like the start of like a ghost story or some kind of creepy thing. I don't know. I just feel like there's something unnerving going on here. I don't trust this. The only thing I really have to say about this excerpt as a whole is that I'm lacking clarity on who the characters are, where, what they're doing in the scene. Amber, I know what she's doing and the story reads like she's the narrator, but it seems like there's another character there and I can't tell if that character is the I that comes in later or if it's a different character. So I would just focus a little bit on clarity. It seems like you want a bit of mystery and I think that you can maintain that. This one is written by Carly. Thank you for submitting Carly. Um, it's from a short story and, and Carly has kindly left us a content warning saying that this one has COVID, so. Everything had been manageable for the first few weeks or at least something close to it. So in the sentence structure, it's unclear if this is referring to the first few weeks or manageable. So is it something close to being manageable or something close to the first few weeks? I think it's something close to manageable but the sentence structure makes it seem like it's the first few weeks. John, the extrovert, missed people, missed other people the most. He missed getting to pace around. I'm gonna change getting to. He missed pacing around his classroom as he lectured on Sendak and Rockwall to his 2D studio at the new school. Mourned all of, okay, mourned the lost coffees with colleagues in Union Square. That last lost semester, he had also been a thesis advisor and had felt horrible the entire time, trying to prepare students for virtual presentations and graduation and ease their fears about job prospects. Um, this may be, this is some telling. Is there a way? John wished he could have consoled them all in person. He turned 40 that previous November and had noticed the first gray streaks in his dark curls a month or so after. It had both rejuvenated and terrified him. Being around people is good for me. John signed on scheduled Zoom calls with friends drinking wine out of Ikea glasses. I'm gonna say drinking wine out of Ikea glasses on opposite sides of the country. I just think that'd be cool. It keeps me young. I'm like a vampire. I feed off of it. Now we have a new character. I'm gonna put them into a new paragraph. It was harder for Andy, especially in March. 
He normally worked from home, an expert in lighthouse work and the art of after-school snacks, which were always ready for Kate by 3.15. The joys of freelancing, um, I'm gonna say freelance journalism. I just think when we can get specificity about what a character does, why not specify it? But like most people, he was scared. And he didn't like the idea of not being in control. This is getting a bit telly, maybe too telly. Just because I feel like there is a decent amount of telling in this piece already, it stands out to me more. When you only use telling when necessary, you almost are thankful for the telling, I find, because it provides you necessary information that you crave. But when the narrative is kind of built on telling, which in this case, the character details are all grounded in telling rather than showing, then the telling almost feels a bit tiresome. So I wonder if maybe this thumb of the telling here could be ironed out. He feared unwanted drastic change and losing those close to him, all issues he'd been in the process of working through for most of his adult life. See, and it's hard for me to make this more concrete when I don't really know anything about the character. This was the worst case. Does it want worst case to be hyphenated? I guess it does. That place on Henry Street is presumed to have the most deaths out of all the nursing homes in the country, he'd said, pacing around the living room running his right forefinger across his thumbnail to steady himself. See, that's a great detail. The showing is beautiful. Do this, what, what you just did in that sentence, do that through the whole thing. Take that, do something the same for like most people he was scared. He didn't like the idea of not being in control. Take exactly what you did just there, a physical detail, something the character does, a habit they have developed, and place that when you are saying objective qualities about a character. You're not in a nursing home, love, but I understand. John tried to console. He's not doing anything. He's in charge of the whole, I will get demonetized. He's in charge of the whole effing country. Um, and he's not doing anything. Um, oh, sorry, I missed a sentence. Andy's voice shook as he spoke. I'm just gonna shook. So if your voice is shaking, it's as you're speaking, right? Your voice can't shake if you're not speaking. So Andy's voice shook and John made a mental note to check on upon his value perception. Okay, he's not doing anything. He's in charge of the whole effing country and he's not doing anything. Yeah, that was a real kick in the nuts, wasn't it? Watching world leaders not do anything. All John could do was sit and listen and rub circles in the spots on Andy's back where the muscles nodded. Breathing for the two of them. Oh, I really like that. Tendy, tendy, tendy. Kate, they were finding had a sixth sense when it came to empathy. She'd curl up to knowing when to talk and knowing when just being there was enough. I think that's all I'm gonna do for that one. Um, my main note for this is just to look at the telling. Look at the telling and I think that this will be super strong. I think I'm just gonna do one more. So this is just a one shot. When the van hit the mesquite, glass barely cut my arms, but a branch punctured your lung. The tree stretched its spindly fingers towards us and came away victorious. So I did talk about this in the last video, how when you personify nature, it can end up being a bit melodramatic. Obviously this is a personal choice and it's up to you whether or not you think this fits your vision or not. I'm gonna try to edit it away. I think especially when you just had like a really intense first sentence in my personal opinion, but obviously leave it if you like. So I'm gonna just say the trees, spindly fingers, at, not gingers, <laughs> stretched towards us. The front window was shattered. I'm gonna try to cut the the was. It's not the most visceral verb, so maybe let's try. The front window shattered, we could say over our faces. And then now that's a comma splice, so I'm just adding semicolon. Leaves jutted from your chest as if it was its own sapling. Oof. Blood dripped from them, the same color you painted your nails and lips. The same color, so that should be you'd painted because that had happened in the past. Blood dripped from them, the them is not entirely clear, from the leaves, from the branches, we'll say from the branches, the same color you'd painted your nails and lips that morning. Hot stickiness chased away the broken air conditioning and mosquitoes buzzed against my skin. I think I know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say the air was air conditioned in the car and it was cool, but now the air is hot and sticky outside and it's chasing that away. But it kind of sounds like the air is chasing away the air conditioner itself. I'm gonna get rid of this air conditioning thing. Hot stickiness. Let's see. Mm, clogged. Every breath hurt. The airbag left a massive bruise. So this is also a comma splice. Just because each of these clauses are dependent, or uh, sorry, independent clauses. The airbag left a massive bruise. 
So I assume that this is this is obviously past tense, but it's written in a very immediate way. So the narrator obviously like has already experienced this because it's in the past tense. So they know that there was a massive bruise there because I assume they've seen it. However, I wouldn't, I don't know if the bruise is the thing to describe right now because you wouldn't be seeing the bruise. But the airbags hit, I've never been in a car crash, airbags hit like your face, so would it bruise your face, your chest? These things sound connected, so it seems like it's referring to like the chest lung area, whereas I assume the airbag would bruise like your face? Um, every breast. Okay, let's say every breath hurt. I assume that if an airbag hits your face, it would almost feel like getting like punched in the nose. Every breath hurt. Okay, like, wait, let's say, let's say my lungs aching and nose swollen. My arms were pinned behind the wheel and the airbag. When I pulled them out, I jarred the shards that lingered in the muscle. You could have a comma there. They formed a strange hillscape silver trinkets, leather bands, and red canyons. I'm not sure what that, what is they? I'm gonna add also add the Oxford comma because I like the Oxford comma. Okay, I do feel like at this point, I feel the narrative is lacking a bit of panic, re the passenger who seems fatally wounded. Maybe more frantic, choppy sentence structure could be used to recreate. Also fix that I didn't spell it incorrect. I unbuckled and nudged your temple. Your head rolled against the headrest, then fell back to its former position. You had still been asleep. Um, you had been asleep when I lost control of the car. Okay, so you're, the person's dead. Just four hours earlier, my mom had fixed your hairpin. Oh, is this a wedding? Oh God, this is so tragic. Just four hours earlier, my mom had fixed your hairpin. Her wedding ring's diamond sparkling against your ash falling streaks. Oh, maybe she's just combing her hair so that we see her wedding ring. She told you to command every room you'd enter. She told you to command every room you entered and pressed a rare kiss to your cheek before you got into the dusty van. She didn't have any words for me. We had screamed them all last night. Instead, she pulled my jacket closed so it covered the feather charm belly chain. When she hugged me, her perfume squeezed me tighter than her arms did. Oh, that's great. Lovely. Can we, um, description of what the perfume smells like? I think that would be interesting. I threw my jacket into the back, the phone in its pocket. I thought I was a careful driver. Um, I'm gonna say didn't text while driving, didn't check my phone. The reason I'm doing that is because we have a character referred to as you in this piece. And so for the character to start referring to themselves as you, it seems like they're referring to the other character. Now there wasn't enough room to reach it from inside the car, but if I got out, I had to leave you. I mean, you can't get out of the car, just go around to the back and stay. Okay, wait, I'm gonna ask, is this just emotional? i.e. doesn't want to get out of the car and be out of sight? Or is it logistical? As in, can't get out of the car? Is it literally just, I feel like I would be leaving you to get out, get into the back and get my phone because of emotional things? Or like, if I get out of the car, I can't get back in? It felt like cutting our connection. Okay, I see, as if your death was only real if I left this moment. Hmm, it felt like cutting our connection. Maybe this is a bit too upfront, familiar, not, it's fine. I, I don't take huge issue with it, but I feel like it could be said in a more visceral way. Um, let's try something. Let's, let's try something. Okay, if I got out, I had to leave you. I could sever our connection maybe. I don't know, something like that. Mm, I don't know, that's not amazing, I feel like, I'd have to think about that more to think of a better way to say that. But I, I do want to keep as if your death was like, that was, that's great. That's really great. By the time I had finally moved, after I had called, um, after I had called 911 and the ambulance arrived, the last sun rays sutured the sky. The dusk was beautiful. You weren't there to share it. Oh man. 
So that's a one shot, right? So this is the whole thing. Okay, this is a whole story. Really, really interesting. My notes for this as a whole piece, which by the way, I have absolutely no background or experience with flash fiction. So I would say give us where they were going. It, we don't, I don't think we get that, right? Tell us where they were going when they were driving and how it was significant to their relationship. Like, where were they on their way to? I do love the last sunrays sutured the sky. If you clarify where the characters are going, I just think it's gonna be even more of a gut wrench, you know? And thank you for sending in an entire piece. Uh, that was really, really exciting to just get the whole thing and not have to kind of fill in the gaps there. All right, guys, uh, that was four. So I'm gonna close off this video and yeah i'll try to do another one of these at a certain point i find them really fun to do just because i find editing to be very soothing so it's a good coping mechanism for me and you know we could all use all the coping mechanisms we could get these days i will leave you here um and yeah i'll see you guys on another one thank you so much for watching if you have any questions you can always send me an ask on tumblr and i'll see you in another video